Right, okay, let's get going. Um, good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I hope you're all feeling a bit cheerier after yesterday's news and, 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 and the uh, roadmap, hopefully, out of lockdown. But uh, thank you for joining us for the Digital Surgery webinar where we're going to be focusing on privacy and identity in a, in a cookie-less world. Um, just for those of you who haven't joined us before, just, just a very quick introduction is that, you know, Digital Surgery is a platform, a sort of knowledge hub, which the idea is to set up for sort of sharing unique insights from thought leaders and experts like AJ. Um, our mission is uh, to teach and sort of provide marketing professionals with some practical knowledge and sort of some expertise in the morning that we can sort of implement and start doing uh, straight away. Uh, I'm Matt and I'm the Digital Strategy Director at Celeste. And for today's webinar, we're joined by AJ Hill, who's the Head of Pay Digital at Gravity Global. Uh, during the chat, if you have any questions, uh, please pop them in sort of the Q&A tab at the bottom there and we'll try and answer those at the end. Um, I think AJ's talk sort of between 20 and 30 minutes uh, and then we'll um, we yeah, we'll sort of we'll, um, take some questions and have a bit of a chat afterwards. Okay, so yeah, from the positive news uh, that we had yesterday um, about lockdown being lifted to the slightly uh, more pessimistic news about the apocalypse that's happening with uh, Google's decision to deprecate third-party cookies. It's obviously the thing that is on everyone's lips in the industry. Um, so I just thought uh, I'd do a presentation to uh, debunk a few myths and just kind of talk you through uh, the moving parts. Um, so in three parts, this talk, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit about a little bit of time um, just running through the context. So how we've got to uh, to this point. Um, and then we'll look at some of the solutions. So a lot of the solutions that are being tendered uh, by Google themselves or by Chrome um, as a, an alternative to third party cookies. And then as all good uh, webinars, I'm gonna actually end with some problems. Uh, so first up, some context. So why are we here? So obviously, unless you've been living under a rock, you, I'm sure you're aware that Google announced at the beginning of 2020 that they are going to sunset third party cookies uh, within the next two years in the Chrome browser. Why is that such a big deal? Um, because it's 65% of all web traffic. Now they join uh, Safari. Um, Safari, as I'm sure you're aware, have been battling the third party cookies and all manner of uh, cross-site tracking for the last few years in Safari with their intelligent tracking prevention protocol. Um, and that accounts for 18% of web traffic. So yeah, we, we're in the, in the kind of the, the high majority of all web traffic now that won't be uh, visible by third, third party cookies. Um, it's a wonder that 18% wasn't a, as big enough threshold for us to panic. We all just sort of said, oh, okay, that's not ideal. Um, but it was only until Google said we're getting rid of third party cookies that we all really started uh, to panic. So that accounts for kind of all web traffic globally, but in the UK, um, it's a slightly different picture. Um, across all platforms, Chrome is tracking at 50% market share. Uh, and in desktop, desktop, that's a massive 60%. And it's slightly different in mobiles. Uh, Safari is more dominant um, with 49% and Chrome is just behind it. Um, so to go back to basics, just to get, give an extra little bit of context to understand kind of why this is such a big deal, let's, let's just quickly talk through what are cookies. So cookies are text files dropped on a user to identify them. Um, and it's often intended at least to create a better user experience uh, so that we recognize when users are doing certain actions like putting things in their basket or the fact they've been on the website before and they've made they might have signed in um, but they're also used as kind of breadcrumbs in this sort of malevolent uh, Hansel and Gretel style uh, third-party cookies are dropped and they follow you around the internet um, so that uh, retargeters and behavioral advertising specialists can understand your activity uh, from domain to domain. Um, but cookies are really important in establishing building the, the kind of the fundamental building blocks of ad tech. So simple things that we perhaps uh, take for granted, like ad serving, tracking, frequency measurement, um, that's all done by third party cookies. So. It's, uh, it's, it has really big ramifications on things like measurement and uh, measuring performance of websites. Um, so as I mentioned, what is all the fuss about? 
Uh, they're only just little bits of text files at the end of the day, but the real, um, the real problem, I suppose, came when GDPR came about because um, cookies were suddenly uh, identified as, as personally identifiable information. Um, so they could be tied back to individual users. So there's obviously huge uh, privacy concerns. Uh, but to a certain extent, third party cookies have become a little bit of a pariah um, for the Internet. Um, they're not without their faults. Uh, they suffer from obsolescence problems. People tend to clear them, delete them. Um, you don't get a full understanding of who a user is. Um, so a change needs to come and a replacement needs to be sought. So what type of cookies uh, are there? There's my favorite, which is a chocolate chip. Um, but in this context, there's first party and third party. There's also kind of second party data that you often hear. Um, I'm going to leave that out. That's sort of out of scope for this. I'll just confuse some people, I think. Um, and we're going to concentrate on, on first party and third party. And the main way of differentiating or, or, or understanding differences between the two is to view it through the context of what uh, the main is setting them. So here we've got a nice little infographic uh, that just explains um, the difference. So first party cookies um, can be set by the publisher's web, web server on any JavaScript loaded uh, on the website and they're available um, to any domain uh, that created it. Whereas a third party cookie, uh, it can be accessed by any domain that's loading the third parties, um, the, the JavaScript that created the third party cookie. Um, so in this instance, you have a situation where multiple publishers can read third party cookies set by one, um, one domain. Now, when this becomes a huge problem is when we view this in the context of how we buy ads. So um, if we kind of escape the Google Ads ecosystem and architecture for a, system, for, for a moment, uh, we obviously have multiple SSPs that are trading ads over the internet. Um, and in order to understand who those users are and bid against those users that might have been to the site in the context of retargeting, we need to perform lots and lots of cookie syncing. So, um, if a user goes on to say, I don't know, I'm into my trainers office.co.uk, we want to understand that they've looked at some awesome pair of shoes and we might want to show that same pair of shoes to them on a publisher website uh, that they go to. Now that publisher might be selling that inventory uh, through multiple SSPs and each SSP is going to label that user in a different way using their own individual third party cookie. So in the bid request that comes through, we need to understand how SSP1, SSP2, SSP3 uh, categorizes that user and whether that matches with my understanding of that user based on the ID that I've set against that. So you have loads and loads of cookie syncs um, using third party cookies and that creates huge latency and huge uh, problems in page loading times. That's a real problem for the internet. And I've already mentioned that people tend to delete their cookies uh, and clear them out and they expire. They tend to expire after about 30 days in, on average. Um, and that just creates a problem for a variety of reasons, understanding users, being able to um, understand how many times that we've hit them with ads, uh, how frequently. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a huge problem um, with third party cookies. So why don't we just switch to first party cookies? Well, as I said, only the domain that sets them can read them. So as soon as that user leaves the site that set that cookie, um, we've got a huge problem. We don't understand who they are. We use a third party cookie to understand where else they go and tie it back to that data we have um, against them in, in a first party environment. So as things stand, um, things like retargeting on the open web, uh, any behavioral targeting, understanding how users behave across lots and lots of different domains, multi-touch attribution. So when users like click on an email, click on a banner, do lots of different things, all of this post view attribution in the absence of a click through to the website, just being able to drop a cookie on, on a, um, an ad view. And as I mentioned, frequency and recency capping. Um, DMPs, so cookie stores to understand these users and be able to segment. This is all predicated on third party data. 
and even the big um, scaled wall gardens, the social networks, Facebook, uh, they rely on social widgets that are integrated in publisher websites to understand that their users, when they're leaving Facebook and, and other environments, uh, to understand what they're doing on, on publisher sites uh, and tie that back and give them that rich data. So not even Facebook are, um, are safe from the deprecation of third party cookies. Now, some clever bods have been basically spending the last few years with every kind of iteration of, um, of intelligent tracking prevention uh, in the Safari browser, trying to circumnavigate. And one of the tools, one of the tactics that they've used uh, is placing third party cookies, first party cookies in a third party context. So what the hell is that? Um, I've already kind of alluded to it. Uh, an example, a great example that the social networks are doing is, is using social media logging boxes, uh, integrating those on third party sites, and that enables um, Facebook to drop a first party cookie in a third party context and then tie that back so that when a user visits facebook.com, uh, the site will recognize not only that they've come to the Facebook website, but they've also been on other pages. Um, ITP2 uh, was, um, was set up to, to solve this problem and to tackle this problem. Uh, it detected cross-site tracking and, and then partitioned those first party cookies, making it impossible to, uh, to, to do that. And the big question mark is whether Google will do the same at the moment. Um, the only thing that they've said is that they're gonna deprecate third party cookies. In a further attempt to try and convent these, uh, these protections against user privacy. Um, some, in inverted commas, clever ad tech folk are continuing this, this massive cat and mouse game um, with the browsers, trying to not just use cookies, but do away with cookies altogether and replace that functionality by using local storage. Um, so placing the history of a user's browsing behavior in local storage for access later. Um, but another iteration, so ITP 2.1, uh, came in to block use of third party cookies after uh, 24 hours. Um, and then version 2.3 prevented local storage being used by third party cookies. So I think the point here is that Safari especially um, and browsers in response to Safari's early actions, like Chrome making the decision to uh, deprecate third party, third party cookies, there is a reason for it. And the reason is to try and preserve um, user privacy. The big kind of difference between Chrome and Safari is that Apple and Safari don't really care too much about the ad supported internet, but Chrome does. So Chrome have a vested interest in trying to preserve the status quo um, and the quid pro quo, which is if you want to get free content, then you have to put up with ads and nowadays uh, behaviorally targeted ads. Um, but Chrome not wanting to uh, lose pace with, uh, with Safari, they have to, they have to adapt. Um, and Safari have just closed these loopholes one after the other. And it really is about making sure that tracking just dies a death, that's Apple's goal. And, so far, um, and that's Safari's goal. And Chrome are taking a slightly different act where they want to preserve user privacy, but also maintain some form of ad tracking. Now, one thing uh, that is sort of abundantly clear uh, when you're trading media and trading ads is that uh, a huge percentage of the CPMs that publishers can yield uh, derives from being able to understand a user in any given context and understand a user given their, uh, their behavioral history. And being able to understand users comes in two forms. It comes in deterministic data and probabilistic data. So deterministic data uh, really relies on concrete information that we have um, about a user in terms of their digital identity. So there's lots of different identity mechanisms that we can use depending on the environment that the user is in. Uh, obviously the cookie is the most obvious one, but it does apply to mobile. So things like IDFAs and mobile um, IDs in the mobile environment um, and more post 
or traditionally personally identifiable information like email addresses uh, and phone numbers. So they can obviously create that one-to-one -one connection with a user and by bundling those together, we tend to get a holistic view of a user across multiple devices and multiple environments. Now, probabilistic data uh, uses non-deterministic signals. Uh, so data points that make up a browser's user journey so that they can stitch those together uh, to understand to a sort of a high level of probability whether user A is actually user A when they move from, uh, from one environment to another. So data points that that includes are things like IP address, browser fonts, browser language, browser type, time zone, information that is stored within your browser um, that's not necessar ne necessarily tied to you individually in the same way that your email address is, so only you can have that email address. Multiple people could have an IP address, the same IP address, the same browser fonts. But in aggregate, when you stitch all of those together in combination, you can understand whether um, that user is in all likelihood the same user that you think, uh, think of them to be. It's often referred to as, as fingerprinting, um, which has got quite a hard rep because again, it falls in scope of uh, Safari blocking through, through their ITP, um, trying to get rid of these practices because it's seen as a, a way of tracking users without their consent. There's no real way of users either giving explicit consent or withdrawing that consent um, with probabilistic and, uh, and fingerprinting techniques. Um, but the good thing about probabilistic is, is that it doesn't rely on third party cookies. So in theory, that is the problem solved. If we are in a world without third party cookies, probabilistic data uh, is the only thing that remains. Well, Again, as I've mentioned, that's not necessarily the case because browsers are limiting the amount of information um, that is going to be passed through in bid requests. So things like IP address, things like fonts, uh, they're going to be obfuscated and they already are in, uh, in Safari and, uh, and Firefox um, in an attempt to try and homogenize users. So regardless of what font you use or what language you use, um, you'll all look very, very similar. And when you remove a lot of those data points and you only have kind of three or four data points in which to stitch together, everyone looks the same. And the differences between those, it's just, uh, it's just not big enough distance uh, difference for you to be able to, to tell apart user A from user B, et cetera. So the percentage match rates and the accuracy of those probabilistic audiences um, is, 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 is really decreasing quite drastically as, as uh, browsers take more and more steps to get ahead of this type of tracking. So introducing browser wars, um, which is kind of what, where we are in terms of why Google has uh, chosen to, uh, to finally deprecate third party cookies. Uh, Safari, we're already doing it. Um, there's other smaller players like DuckDuckGo. Uh, they've always put privacy first, but they're obviously a very tiny browser, um, tiny, tiny market share. Uh, Firefox have started blocking ad tracking by default. Talked a lot about ITP and we'll, in the next slide, uh, give a little bit of an overview and a timeline of the steps that they take to try and preserve user privacy and, uh, and, and get rid of all, all types of, of tracking. And from a sort of a macro point of view, um, since the, the big Cambridge Analytica scandal, it's really become front of people's minds. Um, people are becoming a lot more aware, not necessarily that third party cookies are responsible for all of this ad tracking that we see um, and cross site tracking, um, but people are a bit more aware of at least the fact that their personal data and their browsing behavior and their user history is being used to create user profiles and behavioral models against them that can be used for ad targeting and can be used essentially to line the pockets of big tech. So people are, are starting to challenge um, the status quo and challenge the quid pro quo um, of the internet, um, which is why Apple have made such um, such bold strides to, to remove it. Um, 
And again, third party cookies, they've just become the pariah, the sort of the poster boy for, for ad tracking, um, notwithstanding the fact that they are a decades old legacy technology. Um, it's about time that something came in. There is uh, an element of bowing to pressure um, from privacy advocates. So a quick overview of um, Safari ITP. So it started with, with version 1.0, um, which allowed a 24 hour cookie access window. Um, as, with every iteration of ITP, there was a workaround that was created by certain players in the ad tech ecosystem. Uh, so for 1.0 to 1.1, uh, the 24 hour cookie access window, um, by that being reduced, the workaround uh, was just that query string parameters and domain redirects were deployed. Um, with 2.0, to try and combat that, the 24 hour cookie access window uh, was scrapped. And then we saw a rise of using first party cookies and server to server conversion and event tracking. Uh, with 2.1, uh, it created a seven day expiration for cookies, uh, which including, uh, included first party cookies set client side. Um, and the workaround for that was to create link decoration that would have unique links for a cohort of users or unique links for certain ads, to add so that they can um, understand where traffic is coming from and understand at the user level um, that traffic. Uh, and then with that, and after that, uh, version 2.2, uh, set a one day expiration of cookies that were set via link direction, link direction, link decoration, sorry, um, for example, kind of UTM codes. Um, so people started using uh, local storage. Version 2.3 is, is more robust still. Uh, it, it allows a seven day expiration of all non-cookie storage data, which includes uh, local storage. A workaround for that, that's reasonably sort of game set and match uh, for Safari. And the point is that with every new iteration, people are trying to find workarounds and there's only so long um, that they can escape uh, escape ITP and escape essentially the spirit of why it's been created it is trying to reduce ad tracking across the internet. So with every, with every kind of new move that Safari makes, eventually there's gonna be this end game where we just can't track users across the internet or at least not track them without users explicit consent which we'll come on to in a second. So introducing kind of Google's uh, take on it. Um, as we all know, they've got, as, as we said right at the top, they've got the leading market share in terms of the browser. Um, they've got a huge amount of logged in user data. Um, every time you use the browser, you're logged into Google. Every time you use various Google properties, the vast majority of people uh, tend to be logged in just for, for ease of use. Um, and they're also, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, player in ad tech itself. So that creates huge um, potential sort of antitrust issues already. Um, and any move that they make uh, needs to make sure that they want to try and preserve, obviously, as much of their advertising revenue as possible. Uh, but in order to not fall foul of uh, antitrust suit lawsuits, um, they need to make sure that any moves they make and any um, solutions that they implement, they don't fall foul of the uh, of comp uh, competition regulation. So they need to support independent and third party ad tech. Um, Google Chrome just simply cannot make all third party ad tech obsolete uh, and provide only workarounds for their, their solutions. Um, I mean, they could do, I just, I just don't think it's, it's feasible. Um, and so in theory, as things stand without new technologies, even their own products will be affected. So uh, their Google Display Network, in order to actually target users from a behavioral point of view across inventory um, that you can buy through GDN, that's going to be affected. Uh, Google Ads Manager and their ad exchange, so uh, talking about kind of DB360 um, and their enterprise ad tech offering, anything that tracks those users, uses third parties, it's going to fall foul of their own decision to deprecate third party cookies. Um, and Google Analytics-ish, uh, think assisted conversions that rely on being able to 
to track in terms of the kind of post view attribution. Anything coming through on a click, uh, nowadays on Google Analytics, you can track with a first party cookie. Um, and that's not necessarily in scope with their decision at the moment. But obviously, with Google, it's not just uh, by display ads on kind of other people's websites through their ecosystem. They obviously have their own uh, owned and operated properties. So Google ads themselves, Google that like PPC search ads, um, that's all keyword driven, um, essentially contextually, contextual based. Uh, so that won't really remain, that, that will remain unaffected, um, at least in its simplest form. And YouTube, obviously, people just going to YouTube, you can use first party cookies to understand the activity that they're doing on site. So that will remain unaffected. But stitching that data together in a third party environment, that will require third party cookies as things stand. Um, so more advanced data sets sets against those users um, will be will be affected. So as things stand, what is our dead pool? Uh, the first people that are really going to find feel the crunch of this are third-party data solutions. Um, good riddance, maybe, uh, a lot of people might say. Um, it's pretty spurious data how they actually collect it, but being able to collect it and then even just port it through um, and, and push it through via big request, that's going to be a really, really difficult thing to do as, as things stand. Uh, Multi-touch attribution, especially understanding users that see ads and maybe don't click on them that's going to be really difficult to do um, to tie that back without the use of third-party cookies and even just really simple things like wanting to understand how long a user has been on the website and then target them with a particular message off-site um, and target them with a set number of ads these things all rely on third-party cookies dmps huge cookie stores that um, have been kind of in decline because they haven't really lived up to billing. Um, but so many people have invested, so many brands have invested so heavily in DMPs um, that they're going to be rendered useless because you could store first party cookies, but being able to syndicate those audience out via third party cookies, they're just they become useless. Uh, view through attribution, the whole programmatic and display ecosystem. Um, and industry is, is, is based reporting around what users do after they see ads and not necessarily click. Um, and things like cookie windows, so even if they do click uh, and go back and purchase within 30 days, all of that is going to create huge attribution blind spots um, for, for advertisers. And retargeting. So a huge part of the industry, um, some people again will probably say good riddance, um, but as things stand, that is going to be impossible to do uh, without the use of third party cookies. So moving on to uh, some solutions. Uh, so lots of people are waiting essentially for what Google are gonna do. Um, there's certain solutions that are available right now that you could potentially invest in or, or pivot to. Um, and there's also third parties creating their own solutions and we'll just explore how they might integrate uh, with, with Chrome um, and their decision. Um, so the first one, it's not really a solution, it's, it's just a kind of a return to um, contextual advertising. Hello, old friend, back to the future. The problem with contextual is well, it's not really a solution, it's just something that already exists. So it's just a case of kind of moving ad spend away um, and, and kind of hiding from the problem uh, and just reallocating budgets to something that already existed. Um, the big problem with contextual targeting is that we can't just move all of that behavioral budget over to contextual because we're going to have a real scale issue. Um, there's so much of the internet that isn't geared up for contextual targeting. Think app environment, think games. Um, and, and, the, and the reason that display advertising is so huge from a kind of a monetary point of view is that you can understand through behavioral targeting a user's history, their behavior, and target them in non-contextually relevant um, placements, but still understand that that user or predict that that user will be interested uh, in the ad that you're serving. So that opens up huge amounts of inventory that in a context on a contextual basis, you wouldn't necessarily pick 
um, to associate your brand with, but you're doing it on the basis that you understand that user's behavior. Um, so there's just not enough contextually relevant inventory available uh, to support the ecosystem. The, there's a huge hole in the bucket. Um, so not really a solution. You'll see people try to increase spends here, um, but it's, it's not a silver bullet. Um, the real long-term solution is Google's privacy sandbox. So this is what they're, they're touting as, as the replacement for third-party cookies. Um, so in the cookie-less future, uh, Google wants ad targeting, measurement, fraud prevention, um, everything that happens and is measured and tracked by cookies um, to be replaced by APIs, replaced by programming interfaces. Um, and each API will have a different application and we'll go through a couple of them, um, but the kind of the Chromium blog and there's loads of resources available to, 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 to sort of do separate research. And I'm in no way clever enough to understand all the nuances of it. And uh, it's, it's very much a kind of a wait and see approach. Um, but they envisage that different APIs will cover different use cases. Um, that third-party cookies are currently doing. So there'll be a different API used for uh, aggregated event measurement and reporting, uh, a different API for behavioral targeting and potentially even retargeting, um, and even uh, bidding um, will, will happen in the browser through an API and not through cookie syncs using third-party cookies. Um, the big problem is that it's really complicated, it's really complex, and any third party ad tech needs to get up to speed pretty quickly. Google have said that they're gonna they put a loose two year deadline on switching this over, but they need to be seen uh, to be supporting third party ad tech and brands and advertisers uh, on this journey. Otherwise there'll be a situation where they make the switch from third party cookies to APIs and Google's own ecosystem and own uh, ad targeting products are the only products that are set up um, to work on day one, uh, which obviously creates huge um, antitrust issues for them. Um, so the first of two of the APIs that I'm going to go into uh, is FLOC. It stands for Federated Learning of Cohorts. Um, really complicated name, but it's aimed at replicating uh, behavioral targeting. Um, so rather than as a user browses various publisher websites, different people will cookie them, and then um, third party aggregators will try and take a holistic view of that user behavior and put them in certain segments and push them through into uh, demand side platforms. What happens is that all of this happens actually in the browser. So the machine learning system will take that history and assign you into a group uh, based on your interests. So they'll create an interest group for you. Um, and you can then, as an ad buyer, target those interest groups. Um, it remains to be seen how much control third parties will have over what those interest groups look like. Google have only really said that trusted servers uh, we will be able to have a stake in this. Um, but as things stand, there is potentially a situation where Google will be the kind of judge, jury, and executioner of, uh, of how we target. So think of Google ad stock segments, but for all ad targeting, um, where the decisions are, are made in Chrome as to what, um, what user falls into what interest group. Uh, and then secondly uh, is Fledge, or formerly known as Turtle Dove. Um, these are all wonderful acronyms. Uh, FLEDGE stands for First Locally Executed Decision Over Groups Experiment, which is, uh, has a slightly better ring to it than uh, Turtle Dove, which was two uncorrelated requests, then Locally Executed Decision on Victory. Um, and what this protocol is aiming to do is decouple a lot of the information that's submitted through the bid request. Um, so rather than understanding a user and um, understanding the context and understanding other information that has come through in the bid request, that will be sent through uh, separately um, in order to preserve user privacy. Uh, and the interesting thing about the Turtle Dove protocol is that 
when you think of retargeting, you think of that individual user and it's the biggest use case for individual tracking across um, third party sites. But RTB House have actually released a, uh, a working demo of retargeting using, uh, working using the uh, Turtle Dove protocol. Uh, so there is hope essentially for um, at least user based retargeting um, and even product level retargeting uh, as well. Moving on to kind of other players in the market. Uh, so the trade desk, who are kind of the darling of ad tech at the moment, um, they are trying to solve the identity problem that is created by deprecating third party cookies. Uh, so they've released Unified ID 2.0. Unified ID 1.0 was based around a, a cookie solution. Uh, so they had to, uh, to pivot in, in light of Google's decision um, and create a, a non-cookie alternative. Uh, and the way they do that, it kind of comes in sort of three or four parts. Um, first of all, it's, it assigns a random number to a user in the same way that a third party cookie does. Um, but it's encrypted, it's rotated. Uh, and the most important part is that any company that wants to sign up to use that unified ID, they are bound by terms and conditions. So rather than kind of the, uh, the open RTB framework being able to be used by all manner of bad actors, um, this will have a kind of a code of conduct, conduct in terms and conditions that all uh, players in the, in the market will have to adhere to. Um, it's got a lightweight single sign-on uh, to make sure that users or consumers can actually link all of their devices together uh, so that all ad tech can understand that user A is user A across multiple environments and devices. Uh, devices. Um, and the big thing about that is that it enables certain operating systems to actually talk to each other. Uh, so things like Chrome and Safari that historically uh, have never been able to understand a user sort of in between those different environments. Unified ID 2.0 from Tradex is aiming to, to, to try and establish that, that link. Um, and it also creates a publisher consent framework. So similar to what the IAB have launched with their transparency uh, and consent framework, um, but it allows users to opt in once to publishers. So it should, in theory, see an end to the barrage of cookie banners that we see across every single publisher um, that, we, that we visit and, and every single time we visit the same publisher, it should, it should put an end um, to that. Now, the big news recently um, about this initiative is that uh, the Trade Desk have actually ceded control. They've handed over control um, and, and jurisdiction of how this technology runs, which was always their intention, or at least what they said their intention was. Um, they've actually ceded control to uh, Prebid, um, which is a huge, huge step. Um, the problem with or a lot of critics of Google, at least, um, have, have pointed out that the protocols, the APIs that they're introducing, they create a huge amount of decision making, a huge amount of data storage in the Google browser in, in, in Chrome, um, which means that whilst uh, certain bad actors don't have access to as much information as they used to. It's all being centralized in, in, in big tech. Whereas something like Prebid, which is open source um, and designed to kind of democratize the, the bidding landscape by, by seeding control over it's seen as a, a real big step in the, in the right direction that no one ad tech player that has a vested interest from a revenue perspective um, is, is in control over such a huge um, part of, of the new ad tech ecosystem. Um, but the one big thing that's unclear, and, and this is going to be, uh, there's no silver bullet to this problem of, of user identity. It's unclear of how, over how this would integrate in Google's new protocol in terms of understanding users. Um, it's, it's really just a framework at the moment. Now, Jeff Green, who is the uh, CEO of the Trade Desk, um, he's been quoted as uh, saying that the Unified ID 2.0 is an attempt to, uh, to maintain the quid pro quo of the internet, um, which is seeing relevant ads in exchange for free content. Now, that relevant word is, is, is the, um, 
the most important word here uh, because I think most people are, are comfortable with seeing ads in exchange for free content but the relevancy is the big sticking point because that's where users privacy um, is really kind of in the firing line and really up for up for grabs um, so the, 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 the we're not a million miles away from a situation where it's kind of your data or your life so in order to um, and I know that's really dramatic but WhatsApp is my life so if I don't accept certain uh, terms and conditions I won't be able to stay in touch with my friends potentially um, and there's a very real prospect that unless we allow ourselves to opt into um, into allowing third parties access to our information um, that we might have this situation where we have paywalls we've already seen it a lot of publishers are pivoting to subscription models um, and we get this hugely fragmented fragmented ecosystem more so than it already is um, but this 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 aspect of relevant ads being uh, being the kind of current paradigm and the status quo um, we've seen with iOS 14 or we are starting to see with the rollout of iOS 14 um, with this, this that was spotted in the wild their um, app tracking transparency framework where they're asking users explicitly a yes or no question um, whether they want to allow certain apps to track them um, across different apps and if uh, we take um, Jeff Green's kind of, kind of quote that uh, relevant ads is, is the status quo, we're seeing that um, actually it's not necessarily the case that users are willing to accept just handing over their personal data, handing over being tracked across the internet willy-nilly in exchange uh, for free content. And this is a really good example of what GDPR should have been and what potentially e-privacy uh, will introduce is that explicit consent we've seen on so many websites it's just a cookie notification we're using cookies we see cookies dropped before that um, banner has even appeared or before a user actually uh, clicks allow we see the cookie come through in the payload loads of people are getting it wrong and it's not been particularly enforced it's been like a almost like digital marketing um, millennium bug and now we're seeing in the mobile environment Apple actually say do you know what we're going to do it. We're going to say 50 50 decision uh, to your users. And it's in response to the zeitgeist of people not wanting to be tracked, not necessarily agreeing to the value exchange um, and wanting a bit more control and to explicitly opt in. And as you can imagine, Facebook and Google that have built huge businesses on behavioral targeting they're really worried um, it's been quite entertaining to see the soapbox of uh, each of them kind of slinging mud at each other um, with Apple's decision to introduce this uh, this prompt in in the latest iteration of their operating system um, because they know that it's gonna gonna harm them um, harm their bottom line um, but a study from uh, Kochava uh, saw that the opt-in rates are better actually than expected. A lot of kind of people were saying that they're going to be around the 10 and 15 percent, but as low as 28 percent and as high as 64 percent. I think that's that differs between verticals. So 64 percent in this instance was used uh, in gaming, um, but it's going to be low and it's um, going to affect uh, the walled gardens. Um, but it's also indicative of users and the way they feel about being tracked online so Jeff Green making this claim that kind of, you know make, making sure that we're moving to a system that uh, maintains that status quo um, I don't know if that is necessarily the status quo that people are uh, comfortable with and so we've potentially got a situation where Apple is giving us this canary in the coal mine situation where if everyone catches up on the browser side of things and establishes uh, a same level of kind of 50 50 opt-in that Apple are doing we're potentially going to see those opt-in rates uh, fall and it's really important I think that the future from ad tech perspective they actually listen to 
user privacy advocates and in order to just maintain pace with Safari, uh, if Chrome don't reduce things like page latency and users seeing the same ad over and over again, people will start moving in their droves over to, uh, to different browsers. So they have to really balance that fine line between trying to preserve user privacy and obviously keeping their shareholders happy uh, in terms of ad revenues. So, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'll end just with uh, a few problems that all of this creates. Uh, GDPR and, and e I mean, whatever happened to eBrizzy, there's a kind of pandemic shaped um, hole uh, as to why that's not necessarily been put into force immediately. Um, but if that comes, it will be a potential game changer and any technology that replaces third party cookies, any consent me mechanisms, consent management platforms that link up to new protocols and new APIs, they need to make sure that they don't fall foul um, of the new e-privacy uh, regulation. Um, and so many people on the GDPR side have been getting it wrong. And it's led to the situation where companies like Apple, like Firefox, like DuckDuckGo, they've taken things into their own hands um, and they've created browsers that are privacy compliant um, and do protect users' privacy and, and put privacy first in terms of user journey, not ad revenue. Um, and so lastly, the privacy headwinds, they are coming. Um, they're still blowing. They might not be blowing with such, um, such gale force winds as they were a few years ago um, because European Parliament have had other things to deal with, uh, Brexit being one. Um, but it's just a note on, on the fact that it took Google two years to finally integrate their own consent management uh, platform funding choices with the IAB's transparency and consent framework. Being predicated on third party cookies and then switching to something, some alternative, that potentially kind of crumbles away that um, all that work that's been done to try and harmonize those, those two bits of technology. Um, I've already mentioned that websites are loading cookies without users' consent, um, and the e-privacy regulation, if and when it does come in, will put paid to that and put more control um, at browser level for users. Uh, and so the question is, what will happen when consent mechanisms and privacy will finally converge and catch up with user sentiment. We've seen really low opt-in rates already on the iOS 14 update. If that comes through into the browser environment, uh, will we see huge decreases in the amount of users that we have, um, that we have, that we're, that we're able to target from behavioral point of view. Um, and sort of finally, any technology that that does replace third party cookies. It just can't be third party cookies in a different name. It needs to be privacy compliant, privacy first, preserve users um, privacy protection across the web. And it can't just be sort of robbing Peter to, uh, to, to pay Paul. It's in response why we're here to privacy advocates and users desire to be more anonymous online. Um, so lastly, Google have got a really big kind of decision or a real tightrope to walk. Um, it's honestly too early to tell what will happen, uh, but Google's going to have to tread the thin line between appeasing privacy advocates and not losing market share to other more privacy uh, focused and less ad supported browsers. Um, whilst also ensuring their new API replacement tools are easily accessible to third party tech. Otherwise they run a real risk of falling foul of anti-competition law, um, which is something that they're already risking uh, with their dominant ad stack um, across both the, the sell side and the buy side. Now that's, uh, that's, that's a topic for another webinar, um, but yeah, we'll leave it there. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, AJ. Um, yeah, it was really good, brilliant. Uh, loads of good stuff and hopefully um, some things for people to take away uh, and start thinking about. Um, if you have got any other questions, please do 
uh, drop them in the chat, guys, and, and we can ask AJ. Um, I've got one or two that um, I've already had through AJ, if that's all right. Um, yeah. One is for someone just asking if it's actually possible to use uh, Google Analytics without cookies and sort of what functionality would you lose if you don't have them? Uh, yeah, so Google Analytics, you technically uh, can use it without cookies, um, but essentially you, you just sort of devolve it to uh, just counting hits. So you'll be able to see the same kind of events categorized, uh, but you'll just lose transparency on what that traffic actually looks like, where it's coming from, um, because you won't be able to tie it back to any kind of meaningful information. So you'll still see your conversions, your page views and all that sort of stuff. But um, you wouldn't be able to kind of understand users average time on the site uh, in theory and you won't be able to see uh, individual sessions um, so it kind of render the technology uh, a little bit pointless um, but everything I've talked about um, kind of thus far is really about third-party cookies not first-party cookies and Google Analytics have, have kind of switched everything over to a first-party cookie model so you can still uh, maintain full functionality in Google Analytics. Uh, apart from the, the individual use cases that I mentioned, um, you can still kind of maintain all that functionality even when Google deprecates their party cookies. Thank you. Um, so, and I suppose just another one I've had through is, is sort of just asking if there's any evidence that the show sort of going cookie list is actually worthwhile. So, really, I suppose, you know, do, do, do people actually care? Or is it that everyone is pretty much just trained now into? The, the uh, cookie pop up, you know, pops up. People go accept. Thank you very much, and then we sort of just crack on. You know, do, do you think people are actually that bothered or around? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question and kind of a difficult one to answer. I think um, whilst people have certainly uh, become slightly numb and immune to the barrage of, of cookie banners, um, that doesn't mean that we can't can't improve user experience um, across the internet. Um, and I think, I think really it's, I kind of talked about the fact that third party cookies have become this, this pariah and, and everyone kind of associates them as this, this evil um, that they, they track around. But, but really this has been a long time coming if you sort of view it out of context of user privacy. Um, they're a, a very old technology um, there are, you know, people clear them, they, 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 they get removed from browsers. Um, that, that really vital information about who a user is, um, in the context of kind of behavioral targeting, it's just not as rel reliable. And that leads to really dodgy third party data sources when you're targeting. So something that's a little bit more robust whilst also being privacy compliant is going to be so much better for the ad tech ecosystem and also something um, that doesn't require lots and lots of syncs in, uh, in the context of sort of programmatic and, and ad buying on a publisher website, anything that doesn't require multiple cookie syncs for every single um, ad load is going gonna, is gonna to decrease latency and, and, and low page in time. So I think it's yeah, about time that we, that we moved over. Um, yeah. Um, and I think just a final question I've just seen pop up here is, is um, from someone on the webinar at the moment is do you foresee sort of server to server integrations like Facebook's workaround in the form of or a CAPI becoming more commonplace for ad vendors? That's some issues on the call at the moment. I don't know if you want to add anything else to it while we're here. Feel free to unmute yourself if you do. Well, there we go, AJ. No, so, uh, yeah, so it's a server to server, server, server integrations. Um, I guess it's kind of most used in, in header bidding. Um, so being able to kind of sync audience data in that environment. Um, the, it's a really good question and one that I don't necessarily have the answer to because the big problem at the moment with header bidding um, and going to a, a kind of a server to server integration is that you it decreases um, match rates when compared to, to kind of client side uh, cookie matching. Um, so you could potentially have a bit of a, a bit of a loss of understanding users. So I don't exactly know how the Google Chrome APIs will be able to understand a user um, between those two different environments. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be 
keeping an eye on the Chromium blog to uh, to try and find out that once Google decides to answer it. Indeed, indeed. Um, well, I think unless there's any final questions, um, that's probably about it. Um, so thank you so much, AJ, for the talk. Really good, really insightful. Um, I hope everyone on the call found it useful as well. Uh, but thank you ever so much for, for attending, everybody. If any questions do sort of come to mind, then please feel free to pop us an email and, and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Um, you know, we've got our next event uh, coming up on Tuesday, the 9th of March, with the One Person Marketing Show. Uh, so hopefully um, we'll, we'll, we'll see you all there and you'll be able to join. Um, in the chat here as well is a link to that. So again, if you'd like to sign up and, and um, you know, join, join us next Tuesday, that'd be really great. Uh, and later on today, you'll sort of receive an email with our next event details, the presentation slides from AJ as well. And then indeed for future events, if any of you on the call today have any ideas of sort of brands, marketing techniques you'd like to hear more about or speakers, then please do let us know and we'll, we'll um, try and get them booked in. And, and lastly, if you want to sort of keep up to date with everything else that's going on with digital surgery, uh, please do sort of head over to LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter and uh, give us a follow and we'll be able to keep you up to date. But thank you everyone for joining and, and thank you very much, AJ. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. No worries. Speak to you all later. Thank you.